This course is about making decisions using quantitative models. So the first topic we'll discuss is making decisions. When you make a decision, typically you don't have all the information you need to make the best one. As you leave your home in the morning, you have to decide whether to take an umbrella without knowing for sure whether it'll rain. When you decide what to major in, you decide not knowing whether you're able to get a job in that field. When a company decides whether to launch a certain product, they do it without knowing for sure it'll be profitable. In general, the consequence of a decision depends not only on the decision itself, but also on the uncertain future events. We'll show the kinds of techniques you could use to make a decision in such situations. So we're going to look at the example in your textbook called Pittsburgh Development Corporation. We'll call it PDC for short. PDC purchased the land that will be the site of a new luxury condominium complex. The success of the project depends upon the size of the condominium complex and the demand for the condominiums. Given the uncertainty concerning the demand for the condominiums, PDC wants to select the size of the condominium complex that will lead to the largest uh, profit. PDC figures it has three alternatives. A uh, small complex with 30 condos, medium condominium complex with 60 condos, and large condominium complex with 90 condos. Now, the future demand is considered a chance event, since the demand level, well, depends on chance. For simplicity, let's suppose there are two possible demand levels, strong demand and the weak demand. The possible demand levels are called states of nature. Only one of these states will occur, and which one occurs it all depends on chance. You don't get to choose the state of the nature you want. Now, when you make a decision, it's always a good idea to state the problem clearly uh, with a desired objective, then identify the decision alternatives and the states of nature. Now, uh, here, the decision problem is to choose what size of condominium complex to build. The objective is to maximize uh, the profit. Decision alternatives are the choices you have. Here, there are different sizes of the condominium complex. And the states of nature are the things that could happen that are beyond your control. Here, there are possible demand levels for these condos. The profit you make will depend both on the size of the condominium complex and the demand level. If you build a large complex and the demand is strong, maybe um, you could probably make a large profit. But if the demand is weak, then your profit will be much smaller. Maybe you might even lose money since you might have to sell some of the condos at a loss. Now, there is a payoff associated with each possible combination of the decision alternative and the state of nature. These payoffs can be shown in a table called well, payoff table. In the payoff table, notice that we have decision alternatives in the rows and the states of nature in columns. To refer to the payoffs, we use a notation V sub ij. Let me illustrate uh, here. Uh, v sub ij. like this, uh, where I refers to the decision alternative, and J refers to the state of nature. So if we build a small complex uh, and there is a weak demand, uh, we have, we say, V sub 1, 2, 1, 2 is equal to 7 million. Notice if we build a large complex, then we could make a lot of money in the case of strong demand. That is V sub 3, 1 is equal to 20. But on the other hand, if there is a weak demand, then we could actually lose as much as 9 million. That is V sub 3, 2 is equal to negative 9. Now, if you knew that there would be strong demand for the condos, what would you do? Well, build a large complex because it gives you the highest possible payoff. Now, what if you knew that there would be a weak demand? Then you would build a small complex because that gives you the highest possible payoff in the weak demand column. The catch is we don't know the demand level until we have already made the decision. Well, perhaps the decision can depend on your attitude toward risk. If you're an optimist and you don't mind taking risks in hopes of a large return, well, then you might build a large uh, complex because you're looking at this large value, 20 million. 
If you are risk averse, then you might build a small complex since in the worst case scenario, that is in the weak demand case, it gives you the you know, highest possible payoff. Or you might think about averaging the two possible payoffs for each alternative and then compare those averages to make the decision. So here I'm going to get the average for each alternative. And let's see, what is the average of 8 and 7? Oh, 7.5, right? Or I could use the average function to get that value, 7.5. And then I could copy it down to the other two cells to get the average for everybody. So the average payoff is uh, the highest at the medium uh, size, so we might choose to build a medium condominium complex. Well, this makes sense if you thought the chance of strong versus weak demand was 50-50. Now, suppose after you talk to people who are familiar with the market and find out there is a much higher likelihood of strong demand. Uh, that is, the probability of strong demand is 0.8 and the probability of weak demand is 0.2 then we could take these probabilities into account before we average. So get the weighted average of the payoffs uh, for each alternative using these probabilities uh, as the weights. And then what we're doing is computing the expected value for each alternative. So let's try that. I'm going to delete these and then I'm going to go over here and uh, uh, enter the probabilities 0.8 and 0.2 uh, for the strong and weak demands, and here I'm going to compute the uh, expected value. So formally, this is a formula for obtaining the expected value of each alternative. You go to each row, you know, d sub i, that is, uh, these, you have, you know, d1, d2, d3, go to each row, and then multiply each payoff, that is, this value, by the corresponding probability, that is, this probability, and then add the results. So go over here, uh, multiply 8 by 0.8, and then plus, go to the second column, say 7 times 0.2, and then add, and then add those two uh, products. So let's, uh, doing, let's do that. So here we're going to say uh, is um, 0.8 times 8 plus 0.2 times 7 uh, is equal to 7.8. Uh, here we're going to go 0 0.8 times 14 plus 0 0.2 times 5 and that gives us 12.2 and third is 0 0.8 times 20 uh, plus 0 0.2 times well negative 9 uh, gives us 14.2. Okay so here are the three uh, expected values for the three alternatives, and uh, what is the highest one? Oh, it's 14.2. Uh, so the highest expected value can be achieved by building the large condominium complex. So based on the expected value approach, uh, we would uh, want to build a large condominium complex. So here uh, is our best decision. Uh, let me highlight that. Uh, over here is the, uh, now this would be considered uh, the maximum uh, expected value uh, of this problem. Now does this mean that if we build a large condominium complex, we will make $14.2 million in profit? Um, no, it just means $14.2 in expected value, that is in the average sense. What we actually get is either 20 million or negative 9 million. So then, what is the benefit of this method? Well, the benefit is that if we, as we compare our alternatives, we take into account the probabilities of different market conditions and use that information to come up with a single measure uh, for each alternative. So it is a logical and systematic way of making a decision. But it doesn't guarantee a good outcome. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. But if you consistently make decisions this way, in the long run, the average payoff over the many decisions you make will be much better. 
than if you only relied you know, on your gut feelings. Another point to make, in real life, this only gives you a starting point for a decision. After you get this result, you should examine closely all the possible payoffs on either yield. We build something called risk profile for this. So this is what it looked like, uh, risk uh, profile. And all it is is just a listing of all the possible payoffs and the probabilities. So here I will write payoff and then probability. Uh, now for the decision of a large condominium complex, uh, risk profile consists of two possible values. So I'm just going to go in the increasing order, negative 9 or uh, 20 million. And the probability of, may, of losing $9 million is 20%. The probability of making $20 million is 0.8% or 80%. Now, when you look at this, you might decide, well, maybe you're not comfortable with the 20% chance of losing as much as $9 million. So you might actually end up going with a choice of with the second highest expected value, the medium one. Uh, because, well, at least you don't lose, you have no risk of losing money uh, in this case. Clearly, if we could predict the future, we could make more money. Here's a hypothetical example to compute just how much more we could make. Now, suppose you have a psychic friend who you think is very good at making predictions. So you ask her if she could predict the market conditions for these condos. So she says, sure, I could do that, but I would have to charge you for it. Since you have millions of dollars riding on this decision, uh, you will have to pay me, oh, just $1 million for this variable information. So the question is, well, would you hire her? We're assuming, I mean, no, no, remember, we're assuming that her prediction will be perfectly accurate. So whatever she predicts is actually what is going to happen. Now, what you need is to compute the value of her prediction and see if it's more than the cost of $1 million. For this, you need to figure out how much more money would you make if you have this information. So you need to compute the difference between the money you would make if you had information uh, versus what you would make without the information. So the value of this information is called expected value of perfect information. The formula is like this. Uh, expected value of perfect information is equal to expected value with perfect information minus expected value without uh, the perfect information. Okay. Now expected value without perfect information is a maximum expected value we were able to achieve already without hiring the psychic, uh, so it's $14.2 million. So this is $14.2 million. Now, expected value with the perfect information is the expected value you would get if you hire the psychic. In order to compute this, we need to run through the scenario of hiring the psychic. Okay, suppose you hire her. She would then look through her crystal ball and come back to you uh, with a prediction. Now, her prediction will be uh, for either strong demand or weak demand. So, let's, let's write that down. Predict. is a strong demand, that is S1, or weak demand, uh, S2. Now if she predicts strong demand, what would you do? Well, you look into the, look, you look at the strong demand column and pick the highest value. So that's 20 million, and you could get 20 million by uh, building the large condominium complex. So you would get the uh, payoff of 20 million by building large condominium complex. Now, if she predicts weak demand, then uh, you would go to weak demand column and see that the highest payoff could be achieved by building a small condominium complex. So the payoff would be seven uh, with a decision of small condominium complex. Now we combine these two payoffs into expected value by using the probabilities. So here we write down the probabilities. Now as far as you're concerned, her prediction is the same as the actual market condition. 
So the probability that she predicts strong demand is the same as the probability of actual uh, strong demand. So it's 0.8. Uh, and the probability of weak demand prediction will be uh, 0.2, the actual weak demand probability, uh, 0.2. Okay. Now we combine these the usual way, multiply, multiply and add them together, uh, giving us, let's see, 16 on the top and um, 1.4 in the bottom, so 17.4 million. So this is the expected value with perfect information, so that this part is 17.4. Uh, so, uh, if I subtract 14.2 from 17.4, I get 3.2 million. So this is the expected value of perfect information. And we're comparing this to the cost of what? Oh, a million dollars, only a million dollars. The benefit is 3.2 million, and the cost is only 1 million. Clearly the benefit outweighs the cost. Uh, so we would say, yes, go ahead and hire her. Of course, this doesn't happen in real life. Perfectly accurate information is not available, but you could still get some information by a market research. Now, information from any market research, information from any market research is not perfect, so it will be worth less than the uh, EVPI, expected value of perfect information like in this case, $3.2 million. The point of getting the EVPI is that it gives you an upper bound on the value of any information. Now, for instance, if someone offers to do a market research for you for a fee of, let's say, $3.3 million, okay, well then you would know that you should reject it because the information it provides will be worth less than $3.2 million the barrier of perfect information. So obviously you would say no. Now, but if there's a possibility of a good market research for a cost of, let's say, one million, one million, well then maybe it'll be worth it since even if the value of the market research is half the value of the perfect information, that is, you know, one point six million, then um, that uh, that benefit would still be more than than the cost. So such a market research might be worthwhile.